if I am a good computer programmer, and I am, I can create a million bots, right? And they can push my point of view out there. Yeah, if you're like a scammer, you just need to post more cat videos. This is one of the major problems of the internet. I still take a deep breath every time I send crypto. That's the voice of God from behind. But then what happened was one of the scammers reported my actual account. And scams and bots and fake accounts. Do you find it incredibly annoying that you have to have a new password, a new identity, a new user ID for every single platform that you sign into? Well, Web3 actually fixes this, specifically NFT identities and NFT domains. I sat down once again with Matthew Gold, the CEO and founder of Unstoppable Domains, about how they're going to make this incredible feature a reality in the future and how important your privacy and data truly are. That's dope. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for hanging out and listening to our continued fireside chats, master classes, and of course, uh, the panels that we're going to be, be doing later. Now, this is the second time that uh, Matthew and I have talked in the, just a matter of weeks, I think, right? Yeah, happy to be here in, in Vegas with you. And in the flesh is, you know, a different experience. It's better. We, the last time was uh, via Zoom. So we were, you know, recording in the, in the metaverse. Now we're in the real world. Yeah, and uh, I can say Zoom, you, you can get two dimensions of an idea, but you can't really get the full thing. A absolutely. So uh, Matt is the CEO, founder of Unstoppable Domains, probably a platform that many of you are familiar with, something that uh, I've been interested in for a very, very long time. As you know, I've owned scottmelker.eth. I think I joked before that I even owned scottmelker.zill. Uh, because back then, obviously, it was being built on Zillica. If you've been following me for the last few months, then you definitely know that I've been trading and investing on BitGet. Now, listen, it took me six months to decide that they were going to be the sponsor for the newsletter. But once I saw their partnership with Juventus, that they were the world's leading copy trading platform in crypto, and also that they're a top five exchange by volume, well, I was sold and I was convinced. And I've been using it ever since to dollar cost average and to invest in Bitcoin. You can also trade there with leverage, but of course, be careful if you're gonna do that. And I don't know if you saw the recent news, but they've also done a deal with Lionel Messi. Big game. Now, you can get up to an $8,000 bonus using my link below, and you can trade spot with absolutely no fees. You also get a 15% discount on trading leverage. Go ahead and sign up right now using the wolfofallstreets.info slash bitget. Claim that huge reward and use the world's best trading platform. And we're talking about how to really, truly own your identity in, in Web3. So I guess we should start there. What are the very basic things that people have to understand, the problems that exist with our identity and privacy in Web2? Yeah. So the problem is in Web2, you don't really have the concept of your personal identity on the internet. And that's because when they had the internet kick off, they didn't have a good way to be able to verify who you were online across different applications. And uh, it just never got built. And you can see this in your experiences online because every app that you go to, you have to create a new username and you have to create a new login. And so on the internet today, you'll have like 50 different logins across 50 different applications. And in software, when you see something like that at the top level, you think to yourself, we must have designed something at the wrong at the very bottom. And what that missing piece is, is your digital identity. Because if you have a digital identity, you can just have one name like matt.nft or matt.crypto or matt.zill. And you can have that same name on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Reddit. And today, for influencers, who are basically the small business owners of, the, uh, of our time, they want to make sure they have a consistent brand across all these different social platforms. And what they really need is a consistent name across all those platforms. And that's what we're building on Unstoppable Domains is those, we're using uh, blockchain technology with NFT domains to give you a, a digital identifier that you can then plug into every different app that you interact with. So you're the same person across uh, platforms. And it seems very simple, you know, it just starts out with a name, but over time you add information to that and it becomes your digital reputation. And that we think is gonna be extremely valuable. And we think is one of the things that blockchain technology is uniquely positioned to help us solve on the internet. It's an obvious idea in terms of convenience. I mean, who wouldn't want to just plug the same username ID and quickly log into everything. But I have a feeling that's not the most important 
side of it. It's convenient, but it also offers you a level of privacy and control that is lacking with the current system. Yeah, because you can own your data that you have attached back to your ID. So when you have that name, uh, like matt.nft, uh, and if applications adopt this standard, this Web3 standard for identity, then uh, when your data is being collected on apps, it's actually saved back to your data profile. And that gives you a lot more power as a user because you can take that information from one app to another. So, you know, when you leave Twitter, for instance, and you want to join a new social network, well, then you have to like re-add all your contacts, get all your friends on that network. It takes a lot of time. There's no way to syndicate that type of information or your previous post or your previous history from one application to another. And that makes the internet a lot less uh, competitive. So it's the combination of having a name that's easy to remember so that people can look you up to find information about you, like your cryptocurrency address. Everyone out here in crypto has you know, 50 different types of crypto in their wallet. They all have these long addresses that are impossible to remember. It's a lot easier to remember a really short name to do that kind of lookup. Uh, and, and then you can take your data with you uh, so that when you join a new application, you don't have to start from scratch every single time. I still take a deep breath every time I send crypto. Like, is this, is this, I, I mean, I can, I think everybody can vividly remember the first time they probably sent Bitcoin to someone. And since it's obviously can be slow, there were times it would take 11 or 12 hours to send a Bitcoin. Right. Right. You, you thought it was gone. Yeah. Yeah. And what's funny is we actually went and looked back. You know who else is scared of sending crypto? Uh, Vitalik Buterin. And, and you know how I know this? Because when he sends crypto to his wallet, he first sends 0.01 ETH, right? He sends a test transaction. He still does this, right? Um, and you can actually go look. I think he most recently did it with Shiba Inu, you know, the tokens when he got a bunch of those. So like, Scott is not you, right? Like the people who invented this stuff are still scared of uh, sending this in here. And that's obviously really bad um, UX. How challenging is that to do cross-chain? Because obviously then you get the confusion where someone's like, well, you could send Ethereum to scottmelker.eth, but what if they don't realize and they send you Solana to, to that? Uh, how do you reconcile that? Because there's a huge educational component, obviously, for people to know, even with that simplified address, what they can or can't send there. Yeah, and that's one of the things that NFT domains and NFT domain systems can actually really help with because we can put that type of checking into the actual lookup. So if you, you know, miscopy, like, hey, you meant to send it to an Ethereum address, uh, but you copy and pasted, you know, Ethereum classic address, like that's kind of a mistake you could make, you're out of luck. But with an NFT domain name, it's much more clear because you're like, here's the, here's the name I'm sending it to, matt.nft, and then you have a drop down, and then you can select it. Um, and we can, we envision a future where we can do additional checks on that too, because uh, before you sign that transaction, you know, you're doing those lookups against that NFT domain name. And we can say, you know what, is this what you meant to do? Like, did you mean to send this transaction or like this account has actually been flagged as a potential scam, that type of stuff. That's where we see the future of NFT domains doing uh, on the UX side to make payments even easier. Now we need to expect people to actually read. Uh, it's very well, challenging. The, yeah, well, I would, you know, I actually like it if uh, you can, you can think about it some transactions are more dangerous than others. So if you're sending 50 bucks or a couple hundred bucks or something, then yeah, we'll just let that thing go through. But if you're sending 50,000 or 500,000 or 5 million, then um, we imagine that you could set up your, uh, your domain profile so that you do an extra check, right? Just like, are you really sure that you're doing this? So yeah, but we need to make it convenient for those easy transactions. So you talked about the ability to own your data and to have control over your own data, which I think everybody's having this sort of general awakening that big tech maybe aren't your friends and you are the product and they're monetizing everything about you. So if you own your own data and you control your own data, will there be opportunities for you rather than these huge tech companies to be the one who monetizes that data? Yes, that's exactly what we say, see happening. And you'll actually see some things from us in the next couple of months where we're actually pushing in that direction. So we haven't really pushed on that yet for you to monetize your data but we're going to have some first versions of that inside of rewards programs and deals with partners. And that's kind of where we think it's going to start because that's less regulated. Um, but then eventually there's going to be entire marketplaces around um, your data. The other thing that's interesting about you having control of it is you can make sure it's accurate. And this is something that's not really talked about a lot, but all sorts of 
problems will happen when other people are providing your data and they could have wrong information about you on your credit report. For instance, people have experienced that, but it actually happens on the internet too in even weirder forms. So uh, if you've ever gone shopping for your significant other and then and then all of a sudden, you know, you go on another site and they're showing you like things that have nothing to do with yourself, right? And that's because they have now added to your data profile uh, that you are uh, like, so I actually looked at mine on Google and they, they literally have like a guess of, and it's like, it, he's 91% male because I guess I do 9% of my shopping <laughs> for, for things for my wife. Right. And, and what I'm saying is, is they don't have a perfect profile of me because I'm the person who knows the most information about me. And we think that it's very natural for you to be the one who looks at that data, who confirms that data, who signs off on that data. And that'll help prevent a lot of problems too. Um, in addition to hopefully switching uh, the model for monetization. And honestly, it's a threat to these big companies like Facebook, Google, and Apple. Uh, and we're already seeing a lot of pressure from those companies trying to offer competing products to Web3 products in this space. But I think in the long run, they're not going to be successful. Do they end up being the Kodak and Sears of the last sort of market cycles and they die? Or do you think that they retool and maybe even co-op some of these ideas and, 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 you know, utilize some of the web three functionality that's being built. It's going to depend on how they adapt. And I think the company that knows that it is under threat the most is Facebook, which is why they're investing so much in building the next, uh, you know, building a VR metaverse, a VR platform essentially for the metaverse. Cause they know that they need to be the next iPhone. And so they're really investing on it. So I think, um, they're the most threatened, but they're also the one that's taking the biggest steps to kind of, sidestep it because they think if they can be the technology provider for these new virtual spaces, then it's okay if they're not the, the data collector. Well, what year was Unstoppable founded? Uh, 2000, January 20, 2018. So you've been through a few cycles. Yes, we, yes, and I was in crypto before that. Right, so you've uh, experienced these market cycles and you probably have at least a good grasp of what adoption looks like, regardless of bull or bear market. For, for you guys specifically with these domains, uh, are you seeing continued interest in them, even in the bear market? Are your metrics still trending up or like everything else we're seeing, are you seeing sort of a bear market for, for this as well? So we recently pulled this for the industry and NFT domains, believe it or not, and we'll see how the rest of the year holds out. But it looks like we're going to be flat this year, which in a market where uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and cryptocurrencies is down a ton and then sales on... Uh, items on secondary markets are down a lot. And that's because there's a lot of new entrants um, to, to the space of digital identity and NFT domains, um, creating a lot of new products in here, not just Unstoppable. So it's not just 100% us. Um, and then also we've seen an incredible uh, uptick from ENS.eth, which is one of the other players in the space. And we support uh, multiple domain name systems. So for us, uh, we we look at it as an industry. So the NFT domains are going to be flat this year. I think the the NFT market is going to be down 85, 90%, right? So inside of a market that's really experiencing a vicious bear, uh, I think that we're holding pretty steady, which, you know, let's see the last two, three months because it's been a rough year. Uh, but I would say that's very positive news for us. And we're hoping uh, sometime in second half of next year, we'll start seeing an uptick again. I mean, that would indicate that at least the people who have been here for a while are starting to awaken to the problem and are probably now buying their own NFT domains. But do you think that there's also completely new virgin entrants into the market who know nothing about it, who are coming first through Unstoppable and seeing that as one of the main priorities and use cases from the beginning? And so we do not have a new flood of uh, new users like we did in 2021 for NFTs. Uh, there are a couple new categories of people that are becoming very interested in domains or NFT domains. One is domainers, which should be a no brainer. So that's something that we're seeing happening more than previous. Uh, and then we're also seeing a lot of, so, sorry, is that like someone who like buys McDonald's.eth as a speculatory, a speculative. So they would not like you to talk about them like that, but domainers are, are people who um, they, with the way that the way that they push it, position it is they look at naming inventory for brands and then they, try to determine like what's going to be a good niche for this brand. And uh, then they build an inventory of domains around that and they help market and build that out. So like, you know, 
in the crypto space, .xyz has become quite popular. There's a lot of people behind that who, you know, helped get those domains to good companies in the crypto space and things like that. So, so they're actually helping facilitate the building around it, not just trying to they flip, do the it, flip they the help, name. Yeah, they, they help do the marketing. They, they help do the traffic analysis and kind of like position because, um, you know, your name is your brand. It's kind of like, you know, if you're located, um, and I'm terrible to like on uh, one of the, like at Times Square, right? Like the primo location, but that's like for a certain type of advertisement. And then you might want to be located in Paris if you're in fashion or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, different dom different name spaces have different appeal to different types of uh, companies. And just to make it real quick, we have an extension .dow, right? And that's very interesting for uh, organizations that are like nonprofit focused, right? And that's a little bit different of a flavor than something like .nft, which is much more for people's, you know, NFT projects. And yeah, so that's how people are building businesses around that. So that, I interrupted you there. That was number one for the kind of users that are coming in or obviously the domainers. So what, what was number two? So brands, uh, we're seeing brand registrations this year. Uh, I actually don't have the exact numbers, but I know it's higher than last year. And what do we mean by brands is what happened last year is a lot of brands found out that they're, they were basically being squatted on in the Web3 crypto space. And we have a brand protection program. So we uh, have I have almost a million domain names set aside for brands to come and claim. And we try to get them to the right people working with traditional people in the space, brand protection agencies, Mark Monitor, things like that. Uh, and so, but they're coming in because basically after last year, they said this crypto web three stuff is going to be here for the next two decades. We need to protect our, um, our brand assets. So let's say eventually every brand thinks that they need to own these walmart.eth Gucci.eth. Walmart actually picked up their ensemble domains, .nft, .crypto, all those already. Right, so this is happening. Yeah, exactly. Very much happening. So what is the relationship then moving forward for them between their classic website, walmart.com, which obviously that's a different example because you're going there to buy things, but a different brand and walmart.eth. How are they using the NFT identity? Are they actually using it as a domain name for something they're building in the future or is it Right now, they're just locking it in so somebody else doesn't grab it. I think they're trying to learn more about Web3. And so just to your walmart.com example, when people come in from a big brand to claim their domain name, we like to talk to their, their legal and their brand protection team. And then we also like to talk to their team uh, that does digital commerce and say, you know, you guys should really be talking to crypto consumers. And wouldn't it be cool if you enable people to uh, log in with their NFT domain? And we have an authorization product that enables that to happen. So for e-commerce, you know, in your example for walmart.com, in the future, I can log in with my name, matt.crypto, and they could pull my shoe size or my clothing sizes or my, uh, if I wanted to buy a larger purchase item, you know, maybe they want to pull my credit report to see if they can extend me a Walmart credit card. This is the type of information I could take with me to that app. So for businesses, we tell them, yes, you need to claim your real estate because uh, you want to protect your brand. But then you should also think about how can you work with Web3 products more deeply in the future to provide better user experiences? In an example like that, Obviously, you're bringing a lot of information with you and potentially giving that to right back to a Web2 company or, or a large real retailer. Obviously, in the crypto space, we've seen a lot of interest in snarks and rollups and ZK and all these things that would allow for more privacy. Will you be able to eventually decide, because if they want to run your credit report, they need a certain amount of information yep. about you. Do, will you have control over what basically... Yes. You offer to each place. Is, is that an a la carte thing or is it yes. sort of a... It's an, so it will be, yeah, it's an a la carte thing. You can also revoke permissions uh, whenever you want to. There are uh, terms of service and legal agreements in place right now with these companies so that they can't uh, keep a copy of your data unless you want them to. And uh, you can go further into the future as the technology gets built out better. They won't even be able to keep a copy for sensitive information. And we imagine that those are more expensive um, systems to build. But for things like medical records or uh, credits history or financial information or KYC, uh, there's already people in the space. Actually, KYC is a good example. Polygon, which is one of the blockchains that we work on, they're building uh, zero knowledge proof KYC. And basically that means you're the app and I'm the user. Uh, the user goes to the app and you say, hey, I wanna look at your KYC information. And I say, sure. 
and I uh, give you I give you permission and you can go over here <laughs> to this other server and you can say, hey, is this guy K KYC uh, qualified? And there's a way to cryptographically, cryptographically verify that I am allowed to trade in the US, for instance. And then you just get back the proof for the crypto, but you don't actually get my ID. And so this is much better because right now when you do uh, trading on like a DeFi exchange, then, you know, I have a copy of my identity information, obviously. The app has a copy of that information. And then the regulator in the U.S. gets a copy. They're at least supposed to. Um, and it, the model that that people like uh, Polygon, ZKKYC, and I forget the name, I apologize, is working on is the app doesn't have to have a copy anymore. The app can just have the proof, right? And then the regulator uh, can get their copy from the user, right? Uh, so that the only people in this, you're reducing it by one, which I think is a huge improvement. You talk about when you're trading on DeFi platforms, obviously, and KYC and all of these things. I know that you love markets. Um, <laughs> but what are the applications of this if you are a DeFi trader or user or someone who's really native to crypto and using it beyond as your login to walmart.com? Are there ways that this will integrate with Absolutely. existing platforms in DeFi and other decentralized platforms? Yeah, so um, we think the first place you're going to start to want to use this um, it, or will be in the unregulated uh, like aspects of the market. So what do I mean by that? So you could log into Uniswap, and I do think that there's a future place where you can run your KYC check in a safer manner by just connecting your wallet. Um, but I think short term, it's going to be more like you can sign up for Uniswap rewards program, right? <laughs> Using your identity. And you know, obviously you need to have an identity if you're going to have rewards program in crypto, because otherwise someone will just Sybil attack you, create 5 billion addresses and go get the airdrop, right? Because people do that already in crypto, like trying to game airdrops and things like that. So crypto rewards, I think, is going to be the thing that you're going to see So as a power user. Uh, and that's where we're going to be pushing into in the very near future. Um, along, you know, and continuing working on the core products of making it simpler to send uh, cryptocurrency to each other and then um, adding social validation to your uh, domain name. One of the other things that we actually do already is when I sign into an app with my NFT domain, the app can actually, if I have my Twitter verified, they can check my Twitter. So they could see that, oh, it's Scott Milker signing into Uniswap. He's famous. Uh, we want to give, we want to give him, we want to give him 20% off his trading today. Right. I highly encourage them to do that. Yeah, exactly. So like, this is the type of like targeted micro influencer marketing that we think can happen um, with consumer identity. And the difference is instead of Google being in the middle here, taking a VIG on, you know, that information, you know, that, the company can instead directly offer you rewards for participating and cutting out that middleman. Those companies make a hundred billion dollars a year in revenue. Um, and that's the type of thing that small businesses could instead use to incentivize customers to discover their products directly and save you money. Oh, when you talk about using it for a social login, I can only speak for myself, but anecdotally, and I've shared this story before, but because I'm a public figure and I'm in crypto, my Instagram, which used to just be about music, it was basically, I stopped using it because it was being co-opted by scammers copying yeah. my name, you know, Scott Melker with two L's, yeah. contacting everyone in my list, how's your trading going? And literally hundreds of thousands of dollars have been stolen from my actual followers by these scammers. But then what happened was one of the scammers reported my actual account as an imposter and I got kicked off Instagram, wow. right? I've since remained off Instagram because now they can't scam people, but that would be completely solved by this. Yes, and this is, this is one of the major problems of the internet is uh, the level of fraud and scams and bots and fake accounts. I mean, it almost killed a $40 billion deal for Elon Musk to buy Twitter, right? So like, we know it's worth at least $40 billion once to be able to have identities tied to uh, individuals online. So it's an absolutely insanely large market for solving a really huge problem. Another one like that just makes a lot of sense to us is mar any marketplace, right? Where reputation matters, uh, whether you're buying, you know, sporting events, tickets or whatever, you want to make sure the person you're buying from is reputable. Well, they can just create a new account after they scam you what's to prevent them to do it. So the way that we look at it online and uh, is that the price of information actually went negative. And so the, I'm going to go theoretical on you guys. The price of information went negative because if I am a good computer programmer and I am, I can create 
a million bots, right? And they can push my point of view out there, right? Uh, and uh, uh, that point of view <laughs> could be be something that's not in your self, not in your interest, because I'm just lying to you, right? Uh, or, you know, or I'm scamming you or something like this. And so what we need to do is increase the price of publishing information again, so that the cost is above zero. Uh, and the way that we do that is by forcing people to add reputation data to the things that they say online. So in your case for Instagram, if the person can't pretend to be you, uh, if they don't have your private key to sign to prove that you're Scott Melker. And that means they have to come and get you and get your private key. And that's a lot more expensive. Uh, and that is the type of thing that we think is going to just improve all of our digital interactions. And we also think it's going to make um, social sp spaces much better online because you can have a much uh, more nuanced way to curate uh, those environments. And at a very basic level, you'll be dis disincentivized to behave badly. Right? I, you, you won't troll people because yes. it would affect your, your score. I mean, it really, when you think about it, it, it could be a huge game changer to the way that we interact online and creating, I hate to say safe space, but you know, more positive spaces for, for people to interact. The way that I think about it is I'm using the word reputation, because there's all sorts of hot board button issues around um, identification, censorship, <laughs> safe spaces, right? There's all sorts of connotations of this. Uh, but anyone who does business you want to know the other person on the side of that transaction. Like, you know, you used to be able to do business with a handshake, right? In some places you still can. And in some social groups, you don't need anything more than a text message. People were making fun of Elon Musk for closing $2 billion in a text message to Larry Ellison. You want to know why he can do that? Because they trust each other, right? Uh, and that's the type of thing that you can get um, in markets if you have reputation. So I think we will have a better digital world if we have... Uh, quality digital reputation, which is what we're trying to build. And it's 100% opt-in. And online, there's plenty of places for people to be jerks, right, already. And we don't have enough places for people to gather to uh, get big things done. Um, and that getting big things done requires uh, some form of reputation. Could that effectively eliminate bots entirely, or it would just be much clearer that they are bots and that they have no reputation score and that they've been so, created in the last five minutes. I view bots as kind of like warfare <laughs> where, where like, you know, every, it's just, all you can do is just increase the cost. Right. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it's going to be the thing that's good enough to make bots go away forever, but I do think it's going to increase the cost on bots, uh, 10, hundred X. And so I hope that it will significantly reduce it because it's not just one thing. Your reputation is all the actions that you take online. And so, you know, if one set of actions, like if your KYC isn't enough, then maybe you upload a funny video of yourself, right? And, and that'll help, you know, and who knows, but I'm saying because we can continue to add new things to it, I think it's got a really good chance of um, helping make that happen. Yeah, if you're like a scammer, you just need to post more cat videos. Something. That, that to <laughs> increase your score. Um, do you see using this digital identity as eventually replacing entirely the way that we log into things and interact? Do you think this is a parallel rail for people who actually care about their privacy? I think people are obviously like, they've got my data, my privacy, and they're like doing that in their iPhone, you know, or it's yelling at Alexa about their privacy. And obviously, I think people willingly give up their data and privacy for convenience. Yeah, we think you can have convenience and privacy. And not only that, we think we can increase the amount of convenience and at the same time, increase the amount of privacy. And how do we do that is because if we make it easy for you to take your data around between apps, then it's actually much more convenient for apps because they don't have to go trust Google or Facebook for your information. They can just ask you. Um, and then the privacy is much higher because you can keep track of who's doing what. It's a lot to build on that back end. There's a lot of people working on it. But this this uh, digital identity community, you know, DID, decentralized identity, we've been around for 20 years, right? <laughs> and so we've been thinking about these problems for a long time. It feels like this is our time in the sun. And really... I believe, and the insight that we had on Ensemble Domains five years ago was that crypto technology, blockchain technology, Web3 technology, you got to have a blockchain basically was the technology unlock in order to make digital identity actually possible. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. From the perspective of a consumer, when you're logging in back to walmart.com, right? You go in there, they know your shoe size, they know your shirt size, you've shared all these things, you want to purchase something. Is this a way to enable or push adoption of crypto payments or is it, I'm assuming it's also going to be integrated with your credit card and all the other ways that you uh, conveniently pay for things now, yeah. but do you think that this could encourage people to actually use coins to pay for things? So on the back end, the 
technology that we are using to to say that this piece of information is true, like this credit score is accurate, you know, this is this KYC is accurate. It's the exact same technology that people use to send cryptocurrency to and from each other. It's just built on top of that. So anywhere that you have the ability to access digital identity information, you're going to also be right next to that technology used for sending and receiving um, crypto payments. And I actually think it's more likely we can push forward a lot of innovation that will help crypto adoption because one, we make the UX a lot easier, but we also can uh, attack things that are not as highly regulated as finance. Finance is a highly regulated industry. They can shut down um, a lot of crypto projects and finance just by saying so, but they can't, they can't really do that for the space that we're in because it's not touching any of those regulated areas of the market. So we think it's going to be a huge assistance if we can figure it out. Yeah, I mean, that was my next question before we run out of time is you're, you're building all these things. Uh, they feel inevitable, but there have to be some threats or potential op obstacles that could either slow or completely demolish progress. Not specifically for unstoppable domains, but I think a lot of things in crypto, everybody points to regulation in the United States, obviously, as the, the glaring one. But is there anything that you see uh, that could stop this movement? So there's technology risk around... Uh, the tech stack being fast enough. So blockchains need to be faster. So that's always going to be there. Um, there's also a risk that the ecosystem is not ready. So at Ensemble Domains, we have to build a lot of our own infrastructure. So if you think about it, like Webvan, when Webvan launched, they didn't have smartphones yet. And so they had a real hard time communicating back to users and drivers. And then now Instacart launched and Instacart's doing pretty well. And that's because everyone has a smartphone. So there may be some things that we don't see. So it's like unknown tech risk and everything else is operational. So um, that that's kind of how I see it on Unstoppable Domains. You know, And we think that it's worth trying now because if we just make the future happen three to five years early, then that's plenty. So uh, what can people do if they want to go check you guys out, uh, if they want to get their first uh, domain. And once they do, what's the first thing they should do with it to start to get comfortable with this and get a feel for why it's important and, and how it can be used? Yeah. So you can go to unstoppabledomains.com and we have domain names there starting at $5 and uh, just sign up for an account, get your domain name. As soon as you've picked out a domain name that you like, I think the first thing you should do is claim that domain name either to the Unstoppable mobile app or to your wallet and set it up for your cryptocurrency addresses uh, and then post that name on your social profiles, you know, uh, Instagram, Reddit, or uh, Twitter, you know, update your, you see people doing that already on there and so that people can look you up. And when they go and look up your name, actually, you have a profile page and so you can start to build kind of like your LinkedIn profile for your crypto web three cred and that's going to build up over time as you have interactions online. So that's that's how you can kind of start building um, your Web3 reputation. Is there an advantage to being extremely early and doing that now? Well, you're certainly going to have better choices of names today than you will tomorrow. Uh, that makes perfect sense. I already own mine, so nobody's going to get that one for me. Scott, Matt, we have a question from the audience. Oh, we have a question from the audience. Awesome. Sorry. Yeah. I hope I can make it quick. Um, I do understand that someone wouldn't be able to prove that they are Scott with two T's Melker, but couldn't they create Scott with one T Melker and then prove that that's who they are? And it's actually a two part question. Yeah. So a couple things there. Uh, what we see brands doing is usually they'll get um, several of the domain names around their main brand name. So they'll get misspellings and other things like that. So like when in Scott's instance, he would try to go ahead and get those domain names for close matches is what, is what we call those um, so that he can protect himself that way. And then the second part to your question is uh, they could claim to be someone else, but you could actually click through and see that information too. So uh, what I mean is if they verify that they were, let's say they're on Instagram, right? And they're like Scott Melker uh, and it, you know, with a slight misspelling. And then they said, they proved that it's them because here's my Twitter handle. You could actually click through to that Twitter and then it would not be his real Twitter, right? Because they wouldn't be able to verify a, they wouldn't be able to verify his real Twitter. They'd have to also create a fake Twitter. So that's the thing about, what I'm trying to say is with reputation data is you have multiple pieces of data, not just one. So, and as long as you can pull that profile and see the list of multiple different pieces, you can click through each of those different pieces of profile information. Um, and then they would have to fake every single one of those. And that's what I was talking about earlier. When we want to make it more expensive for people to fake, they would have to not just fake his Instagram, they'd also have to fake a Twitter. And then if he had another piece of information about himself, they'd have to fake that piece of information as well. And, and on and on and on. Is that what protects us? Is assuming that they won't go that far as to create two or three or four or five or nine social medias? 
So, and then if we go one more layer deeper, you could even put a service on top that analyzes that information and then returns a score or like a risk score. And that's what I was talking about with crypto payments, where I said that like before you sent a payment, we could tell you, hey, this transaction looks unsafe. And then we could do that based on the value of the transaction. Um, so you can add that analytics on top, but the, you have to have a way to add that reputation data. If anyone else has a question, we'll take them. Yeah, I'll do Q&A for a bit. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, do you guys have any developer tools? So if I wanted to build an application on the iPhone, the iPhone app can natively integrate with purchase and domains directly from your platform so the user doesn't have any... Yes. Yes, and uh, for... The we have the developer docs up for like the API endpoints and everything, and we are trying to build those out as absolutely quickly as we can. <laughs> and we will literally hand you the code. So because we have an iPhone app that does those things, so we'll just copy paste the code if we have to to send it to you. Um, but it, it's the goal is to get all of that out there, and we do have the first API docs on our website. Guys, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. That's the voice of God from behind. <laughs> well, I got this guy. Oh, here he is. You're in trouble if Dave Weisberger has a question for you. No, no just an actual genuine question. How do you deal with, I just you know, clicked on your, your website and you know, there's so many different domains. So like in the beginning, you know, back in the 90s, yes, I'm old, uh, I grabbed uh, Weisberger.net as a domain name uh, right after Lauren Weisberger, the author who did Devil Wears Prada, uh, grabbed Weisberger.com but hadn't thought to get Weisberger.net, so I grabbed that one. Uh, Given that there's dot crypto dot this dot you know nft dot com dot io dot, you know how do you handle that just by having the domain? I, I I guess maybe I totally don't understand, and maybe I'm asking a really dumb question. In which case, consider it you know con consider yeah. the fact that I understand I don't know very much. So about this. there are a lot of NFT domain spaces, right? And um, we actually think that there's gonna there's about 1,500, I think, TLDs in traditional internet. I think, and I, I personally think if you just want my, put my thumb up in the air, I think there's probably going to be about 15,000, right, for uh, Web3, right? And uh, so I think that, you know, trying to pick the, the best one is going to be pretty difficult. So I think what you want to try to do is pick one of the better um, platforms, Right. And so you like in ensemble domains for the, the extensions that we have, we stand behind them. And we those are the ones that we work on pushing out to market. Um, and so we try to make better tools for those systems. And we think that's going to be one of the differentiators between uh, NFT domains and then your traditional domain name industry is that it's actually going to matter which tech platform you are on. And we do think that there's going to be a couple of tech platforms that emerge that be that are going to be successful in this space. Um, so if you think about it from that perspective, that may be helpful. Uh, and then, you know, it's tough. You know, there's it, there's a lot of potential real estate out there just to, uh, to pick up. And there's domainers who spend their entire their entire lives trying to figure out the one's better than the other. And I don't pretend to be the best at that. So I'm wondering, um, with all these new TLDs, are, are they like linked in universally with the existing DNS system or do we need a parallel mechanism to be able to browse to them? So we believe they're all going to be interoperable. That is one of our core beliefs at Ensemble Domains. And the reason why we say this is because there are already interoperable. <laughs> so, so like you can actually import your DNS records into some of the NFT domain name systems. So you can actually use your .com or .xyz domain to receive um, cryptocurrency payments, right? And now uh, it's experimental in a lot of places, but it already works. And I think that we're going to have we're going to have uh, back, you know, cross uh, interoperability between these systems in the long run. And I think that traditional DNS over the next two decades is going to end up adopting a lot of the technology standards that we build in the Web3 space because we open up new markets for DNS, right? You can't log into your um, Amazon app. Uh, sorry, sorry. You, you, uh, you, you don't log in with your .com domain name right now. You log in with your email. Thank you, guys. Uh, you guys absolutely check out Unstoppable Domains. Really an incredible company, and, and they're moving the space forward massively for, for all of us. So thank you, Matthew Gold. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Scott. Let's do